Do you hear the birds? I don't know what some of those are. It's up in that tree. I can hear the ravens calling. And the sound of a jet. Hi everybody, it's Robbie from Southern California. And this is not a garden tour. What this is, is gonna be a nature walk. So we're gonna kind of walk through, listen to nature, like the dogs, and talk about what's, you know, what we have here besides plants or what the plants in the garden has brought in. Here, as you can see, this is the wall. It brings in a lot of birds, lizards, and snakes. I love snakes, so I'm not worried about that. I have had racers through here, really no gophers I have seen, and we have not seen a rattlesnake in over a year, which is good. That's a good thing. But the birds and the insects and the bees all come through here. As you could see, being so open like this, so keep this in mind if you are making a garden, that when you have it this open, a lot of rodents don't come in because there's no good places to hide. They would have to go back and forth to move around. And it's so open that they would rather find more dense places. Just common nature. That's not saying nothing comes through here, but there's no gophers, of course. Not here because of the totes. I found one once behind the tote, but he couldn't go anywhere. He actually had fallen off the wall and landed and had to hide behind the tote, but he had no place to go. So here we don't have a whole lot going on. There's no real flowers except for the sow thistle, which is growing in the white bucket in this tote. And that does bring in goldfinches and bush tits and towies come in and different birds looking for either weeds, you know, that are dropping seeds or seeds coming off of the plants or insects. So here we have a small amount of nature, which is okay. Now, my rainbow garden brings in all kinds of birds. I will sit here in the morning and have coffee and just watch all kinds of stuff come in. Hummingbirds zipping around looking for insects and the bush tits and all the different birds that come in. They look for different things. And of course we have bees, all kinds of bees and flying insects. But it's just so peaceful and nice to know that I can create a garden for myself to have food and at the same time help nature in the area. And of course we get caterpillars and different things. Anything in check, you know, when you have a small amount is okay. If you had too much, it would be different, but it's pretty much under control. Let's walk into the bird garden for a minute. Been moving stuff around because we're changing, not changing, but there's some stuff Gary's working on around the house. So we're moving a lot of different things and I'm walking into the sun. So let me walk over there and start over so you can see without having the sun in your face. Now I'm on the other side, so you don't have the sun in your face, and I don't have the sun in my face. The garden is bursting to life. Look how green it is. I haven't planted anything except for the zinnias that are popping up in that container I made. Otherwise, this is all plants that you saw all summer that look so sad that have just taken off because we're out of the heat. Ah, oh, I can say that when we were like close to 90 yesterday and we're going to be pretty close to that again today even though we're going to go into winter in less than a month but the plants are loving the cool nights no matter how warm we get during the day we are getting down into let's say the upper 40s at night but here is where the birds come in they've been eating the greens this is nibbled by birds little birds will sit here and nibble on the greens because greens is very important to a lot of their diet as well this by the way is in the ground not in a container. Here's where I feed the birds. This is going to change up a little bit. I want to be able to sit and photograph the birds really good. Just, it's just gorgeous that they come in. I love sitting here and watching them go to all the solar fountains. The solar fountains haven't started yet because a lot of them are still in the shade. But it's just nice to sit here and I put out all kinds of bowls. I found an old ashtray that I put out an ashtray there and some bowls and this is a chip and dip. I wanted to make a water fountain out of it, a solar fountain, but this is melamine and it's so hard to drill that I thought I'd stick it out here and it works out good because of the sections. They can sit in each section the birds and feed on that and they happen to really like it and that's just an old bird feeder a real bird feeder i've got and of course the hummingbird feeders and things they come in by the dozens and dozens and sometimes the hundreds so we get a lot of birds here what brings in the birds it's a few things you've got to remember what brings in the birds 
is shelter. They have to have a place to land and be able to feel secure enough that they can hide inside of a tree or a bush or wherever you stick a branch, someplace that they feel that, well, maybe they could see you, but you can't see them. That's kind of what they want. Then the other thing is water. They need water. Water is very important to them. So I've got two electric fountains and the rest are all solar. And we have like a dozen solar fountains in the yard. And then the next thing, of course, is food. And that's basically it. Once you've got those three, you're going to be loaded with more birds than you even know what to do with. This to them is important. So I try to make sure I have all three. I'm planning on putting along the back more plants. That's just a simple wire fence. See how beautiful the purple tree colored is? I'm going to put more purple tree colored. That's mint growing up. It's not really doing much for the birds and it's just growing in the ground. So I might trim some of that down and get more purple tree color because it grows like a tree. But look at my lemon verbena. Now this is going to die back as we go further into winter. All the leaves will fall, but it will give them a place to land quickly and decide where they want to go. And that's what's important. They don't need just branches to hide in. They also need branches to come closer and closer in to know they have a place to land. For multiple reasons, not just to eat, but when they drink, you know, that's one thing. But when they take a bath, they get wet and they're heavier. Water has weight. Let's keep walking. And with the weight, they need to be able to get into a branch, be able to fluff their feathers so they could dry themselves off in a matter of a minute. But they need that place to dart into so they can groom their feathers, prune them really nice, get the water off, and then take off. That's what they need. So once you give them all that, you're going to have a lot of birds. So they have food and they have places to take a bath. Look at this. Oh, he just left. This is one of their favorites. We can make that. I've made a ball before and I've showed you how to do it. I've got videos on that. They love the balls, the hummingbirds. So do the other little birds because they can sit there and get the right amount of water on them. So that's what's going on here. Let's keep walking. Like I said, we've got things moved and under construction. Not real construction, just we're doing some simple stuff. Plants is what the birds really like. Now here, this is going to be changed up. This is not a garden tour, so I don't want to talk about gardening. But this is something to think about if you got an old shipping crate from a dog or an old dog crate or bird cage. The birds go in and out of that all day. But what cannot get in there is something like a hawk because a hawk swoops. And when they grab a bird, they have to swoop. They can't land, pick it up, and then go on their merry way. So the birds feel really safe in that. So this works out wonderful. Had an old bird stand here in a cage and sat here, but it's a mess. This is going to be changed. So that's what's going on here. Now let's go take a walk and show you more. And of course, we did have the hornworm that got on here and finished my tomato plant. But you know what? It's going to come back. And that's all part of nature. It's kind of like when there's a terrible fire and we're all, you know, sick about the fire. And yet what happens after the fire? What happens after the rain? All those seeds that needed heat grow. Plants come back. Well, it's the same thing with the insects. With the insects, a lot of times, that's what happens. It rejuvenates the plant and they can come back even more beautiful than they did before by simply having a good pruning. That's what the insects are doing, as long as they don't completely take the plant apart. Through here, we get a lot of birds as well. Here I've got pomegranate trees and it brings in the mockingbirds and a lot of birds and animals that like picking the pomegranates as well as the papayas as, as well. We've had the ravens come in and snatch some papayas. So that's what's going on here. And then the pepper tree. Oh, the pepper tree. Do I have a lot to say about that? This pepper tree, when we got this place, oh wow, uh, quite a few years ago. Let me step back. I'm trying to get, see, and the sun is coming up. It's early morning, so I've got a glare, I know. This pepper tree, we thought, was on its way out. A big chunk of it broke off and went down the hill, and Gary had to chop it up. October 24th, 2010. Yep, the tree came down.
but we thought this was going to go. And what happened was my daughter had a birthday party with a water slide that was set up here, which worked out really well. Look at the sun, it's making me tall. And by having the water slide here all day, this tree just popped back to life. So it wasn't getting enough water. And it worked out fantastic. It just saved the tree. And then what happened two years ago is the Cooper Hawks came in, which we have a lot of hawks around here. And they built a nest up there and there is their nest. The first year they came in, I'm gonna think it was a young pair. They were not quite sure what to do, but they did build the nest. They didn't know how to get rid of the ravens. They fought a little bit. They weren't as bold as they probably would have been had they been totally mature, the birds. But they raised five babies in that nest up there. Five. That was a sight to see. I would be working in my chair garden and they would come down and fly around. They'd land on the wall. They would land on the truck bed. See how the birds are starting to come in? Those are yellow rump warblers. They would land there and sit there and watch me. I'll sit for a minute and then we'll continue on. Kind of made me a little nervous. I mean, I know they're not going to come land on me or anything, but boy, they were so used to seeing me set this up that they would just come and land on the truck bed and they would sit and watch me or they'd land on the wall and they got really close. Interesting story on those five. One of them got badly hurt and it looked like it was going to go on its way out. This was already, you know, completely fledged. It busted its leg, but Gary managed to feed it. Not, we never touched him, but leave him food. And he would come down and take the food, and eventually he disappeared, so we're hoping that the leg healed and everything was okay. But that was the first year. Then last year, they came back, and they had three babies. So they've raised twice there, and we know if all goes well, nothing happens to either one of them. They'll probably be back to start nesting and fixing up the nest. Depending on the weather, it could be February or it could be March, and they'll start working on that. Now, just so you know, they have been spotted here, especially when there's a big group of ravens around here. One of them sits up in the poles, around the pole here, sits up on the wires, and watches the nest. If any of the ravens get too close to the nest, they will chase them off because they are still protecting their nest even though we're going into winter and they're not ready to nest, they do know that it is theirs. So they're gonna build on it. And that's what's going on there. Going back to birds for a moment, just so you know, we've got over 50 species of small birds. I haven't even counted the various hawks we have or turkey vultures. Speaking of a hawk, we now have a red tail up there. Now he's sitting here, I don't see the cooper hawk, but it was a cooper hawk that bred here. But let's, let's take a look at the red tail real quick. Can you see him on the power pole? He's waiting to see if a rabbit or something shows up down here. We have a lot of rabbits, but we seem to have less than we had during the summer. Probably picked off by different things, unfortunately, like hawks and coyotes that we do have here. So things do happen. But he's sitting up there and he's kind of looking around and scoping out the place. Let's keep going. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but the trees here are full of birds. I can see them moving around all the way to the top. And they, it's just the perfect place for them, you know, to hang out. That's what they're doing. They're hanging out because they can come down and go through my deserted chair garden for now. It's not totally deserted because there's still plenty of food in there I still come and ha take out. But they come through here and they look for insects. Or they'll eat the sow thistle. This is sow thistle. And this to them is very important to a lot of birds. This is the seed. And that's what the goldfinches and a lot of small birds eat. Now, when there's weed abatement and everybody is, you know, taking out their weeds, they don't have enough food, so that's when they start foraging and looking for anything they can possibly find, because that is their food. So I leave a lot of it, especially if it's not going to harm anything right now. The tomatoes are on their way out, and I've got some popolo and celery there. So I leave the celery because it's got very small seeds. Some birds eat celery, but they're not that crazy about it. 
But I do see bush tits go through celery. And I think what they're actually looking for there are the little tiny insects that might be around inside the plant. So they'll come through very small birds of bush tits. The females, which is so interesting, they nest here, have white eyes and the males have black eyes. And that's how you can tell on the bush tits. And they'll come through and pick for the insects on that. In the truck bed, oh, this has been interesting. We've had rabbits actually get on top if they can find a way to get in there and have babies in there. So they've used the truck bed for that. But normally, it's a place for them to come and forage in there. And they can sit around on the rebar, which doesn't get hot. And they'll sit there and they'll dart around looking. You know, early spring, when all the hills here have more green, more weeds just starting, grasses, we have deer that come through here. So I get to sit out here by my chair garden quietly and watch the deer come in through here. Then they go down the road, like going towards Gary's garden, and that's where the deer roam around here. That's usually in March, April, and May. We have more deer, and then little by little, you don't see as many deer but you do see them at night sometimes. I've even seen the deer and the coyote roam. And that was interesting to see. And the deer have an upper hand on the coyotes. And that's what goes on here. Now going over here, we have water. And as you could probably see, some of the birds are thinking about coming down to the water. There's a mockingbird up there and he's waiting for me to leave. But here we have three ponds that we're working on. You're still working on it, it takes time. One is a bathtub. And then two are ponds with liners. Gary's designed the bricks around them, I should say cement blocks, that are rocks, they're rock shaped. I was going to wait to see if he was going to come down, but he's just going to watch me. He might be eating the berries off some of the trees. And what the mockingbirds do, you can probably see some berries up there, is they will protect the tree. The tree becomes theirs, and they don't let other birds near it. So he may be doing that and watching to make sure I don't come to take any of his food. But going back to the ponds, Gary has made these bricks, or I should say cement blocks, like he did my planter out front. And once we've got time, we'll get this all done. He's got the bricks around it, the cement blocks around it, and then he's designed all those that do look like rocks. Those are not real ducks. They're from the dollar store they had once. Oh, I've got birds flying all around me. I've had the Cooper Hawks come in and take a bath. So birds are coming into the bathtub to take a bath. And then here, the same thing. We've had various birds. I came out here one day and a dozen doves flew out of the water. So again, water is very important. And as time goes on, we plan on getting a whole lot more plants all along here. And then this is where my garden will stop. And then I will continue the garden on that way. But here I want this set up so the animals can come down. Oh, speaking of animals, I always find the duck laying around. You know why? Because the coyotes come at night and they pick up a duck and then they move my duck into the yard and well, that's what they do. Speaking of coyotes, as you can see, they were here last night. So yes, they leave their droppings behind. That's how we know. Let's walk down here. Now here we've got aloe vera growing. I've got aloe vera there and I've got aloe vera here. And they produce such a beautiful flower. See the spikes? I saved those, those flower spikes. And these make great branches and they pop right out. Let me show you. So if you've got them, don't throw them away. Okay, this there it is. Look at this. 
Is that gorgeous? You can sit this around and you can sit it any way you want and the birds will use this. I'll come back and get that later. I use that also for tomatoes, to use it as a tomato steak. And this way the Orioles can come in and land on it and feed on all the tomato hornworms because they don't like landing on the tomato plant. Keep that in mind. So if you can get some twigs and sticks and stuff in your tomatoes, if you're growing tomatoes in the spring and the summer, then you'll get more of the birds to go in there to collect the insects. Because it, it, it's called trichomes and they're sticky and they get all over and you can't wash them off. If you've ever got them on your hands, you know you can't get it off. Well, the birds can't get it off. So they don't like landing on it. So the first time some of them land on it, they remember. See, here's more aloe vera. This brings in hummingbirds. The hummingbirds and the orioles absolutely love the flowers. But right now, this time of the year, they're not flowering. They may pop a flower and surprise us here and there. Look at this. Tree roots. Look at that. Not sure from what tree, but it could be from the ficus tree because they have a lot of roots. So the flowers are, for the aloe vera, very important for the birds. I just love how quiet it is in the morning. Absolutely beautiful. I'm so glad we have all these trees here. Look at that. Oh, here I've had multiple hummingbird nests. This one had a hummingbird nest in it. We've had hummingbird nests all through these different trees including the pepper tree. There's been hummingbird nests, so they nest everywhere. And keep in mind, you rarely see a hummingbird nest because it's the size of a little bit bigger than a quarter. They're so small. And you think, how in the world do they raise the babies? The nest stretches. They make it with spider webs, and then they weave it, and then it stretches. So that's why they can make it so tiny, and it will stretch whether they have one baby or two. The babies will stretch it. Now here is our firewood that got piled here. Oh, years ago when Gary got the wood chips for his garden, this is all wood chips down there. They asked once, they called and said they had a truckload of cut up wood if we wanted it. And Gary said yes, so they dropped it off. And we have used it over the years for firewood, little by little, there's a whole lot here. But this is where he found those bees. Now we knew we had carpenter bees because the ones in California are solid black. But what we thought, and we did think in the beginning, or I should say, I'm going to have to say Gary thought more it was bumblebees. I wasn't sure because of, there they are. Let me talk about that for a minute because this is interesting if you didn't watch on the bumblebees. Now, Gary thought they were bumblebees. I was not 100%. He's in there right now working that. And that's why I continued we thought it was one species of bumblebee and I continued to go ahead and see all the birds flying around and do research until I finally found them. And they were not bumblebees. We have carpenter bees in the large log down there and they're the black ones, the ones everybody sees in California. A couple different sizes but they're completely black and they're solitary and they will make a hole and go in and out. But these bees are quite different. Now these particular bees kind of throw us as far as, well, their behavior. They're supposed to be solitary. They're not completely solitary. They're actually a bee that's found a lot in Texas. They either hitched a ride or they've been living here and they showed up here. They seem to be very docile for us. See, there's two of them, they're flying around together. They don't act like carpenter bees. They're not solitary. We've actually seen one feed another, which was the strangest thing to see. They do have multiple holes in there, but they may have created some sort of hive. We're not sure because they seem to go in and out. We're confused on them. But what they're called is the horsefly-like carpenter bee. Interesting name. They have a little bit of fuzz like a bumblebee. Not as fluffy as a bumblebee, but they do have some fuzz. And they just showed up kind of like Gary's bees that just showed up which are there and beautiful day they are out and working so let's talk about Gary's honeybees Gary's honeybees there they are in the box he built let's make this long story into a short story Gary wanted bees I had never been stung by a bee really didn't want any bees and he decided since we had owls and Amazons that fly around here and they were here this morning flying around screaming and screaming and then you'll see them suddenly dart down because they saw something to eat 
Well, they fly around here in groups of 50. So he thought if he put up a really nice nest box, which he built, and you can see the front of it and everything has got, he took a tree and he put the outside bark on there and everything, that maybe he would get an owl or get possibly an Amazon. Instead, what he ended up with within days up a palm tree. Like I said, go watch the movie. We actually made a movie on it. What actually happened is within days, a queen came, showed up with 10,000 bees. They all went inside and he climbed up that tree in the middle of the night, unhooked a box and brought it down. And with eventually, within 24 hours, set it up here. See, he keeps a hummingbird feeder up there in case they start to bother mine. It's even got an ant moat so the ants can't get to it. He can put sugar water in there and he only does it when they can't find enough food. And I know that they'll show up on my feeders and we generally can tell in the direction they're flying if it's his bees and he just puts up the hummingbird food and then they stop bothering the feeders. So that's them and that's what's going on there. And he's got his bees. No, he does not collect the honey, but he does have a hive now he might set up in the spring. And we'll see what happens. But yes, I ended up being stung and he was really happy because all it was to me was I got stuck, swelled like nothing. And it was just no big deal. So now he feels he can have bees. So maybe he will end up doing honey, but right now he just really enjoys having nature and bees, including the carpenter bees or whatever bees that are around here in the garden. So let's keep walking and seeing what else we can talk about. So this is kind of like the backside of my garden. This is, Gary's garden is down there. We normally have this place covered in rabbits, especially in the spring. They'll be jumping all over, but they'll be going in and out where all the plants are. And this is the backside. That's an old avocado tree that's been there. I think it's coming up from the rootstock. This area years ago was an avocado grove. And so they had avocado trees and citrus trees. So some of the citrus trees might have been planted years later, but some of them could have been here for 50 plus years. You can see all the birds flying around. So some of the trees are old, like those avocado trees are definitely old. So there's two there actually. And there's another one here. And over the years, a lot of them, see? This is another one that has died out. They've just died out. There's been issues with avocados. There's another tree there that died out over the years. I don't ever remember seeing that tree. You know, they're old. Some of them are close to 100 years old. It was at the turn of the century in the early 1900s that they had a big avocado grove all through here. And then years and years later, they separated the properties and started to build homes. And some people took out their trees. And well, I didn't, I left them. I had 32 trees when I moved in here back in the 80s. And over the years, most of them have finally died back. We've trimmed and kept some of them alive, but a lot of them are really on their way out. But here, I water it, and there's never been any avocados on that one. Have gotten a few off of that, but it's probably coming from the rootstock because they don't taste right. They're stringy, and when, you're, when they're stringy like that, though you can, you can mash out part of the wonderful pulp, it just doesn't taste right. And you know you know because of the string that it is coming from rootstock. But that's what's back here. So we've got, I think that's plumbago. I could be wrong on that. We've got some four o'clock flowers there, got some succulents, some of this stuff we planted. There's some jade plant up there, but of course Gary planted a lot of the elephant food plant up there. My pomegranates are up there. That's where you see my pomegranates. And just so you kind of got an aspect of where my garden is. Right through here, see that? That's where my rainbow garden is. Right on the other side by the house there. So I've got a fruit cocktail, that's a grapefruit plant and then I've got some orange trees in there and I think there's a mandarin some type of orange tree in there I'm not sure what this one is it might be a lemon so there's various plants in here trees and different plants ah scrub jay see how the birds are coming in there's my moringa that you see in my garden dying back for the winter and then of course there is my pine trees that are in the front yard now there used to be four one of them had to come out years ago because it was too close to power lines. So they came to us and they asked if they could take out one, possibly two. So we went ahead and took out the pine tree that was leaning a little, but the other one was kind of skimpy and I didn't know if it would make it back, but it did and it's getting a lot of top growth. So we've got the pine trees, which are really nice because the birds absolutely love them. And of course, 
the one palm tree up there, which brings in a lot of kingbirds. The kingbirds go up there. I have had ravens up there, which is so funny. They've come in when we have parties and I've seen them up there eating cake. They would find some, maybe some cake that some kids left around the yard and they would go up there and they tuck the cake up on the top of the, the palm tree and they would come back and eat their cake and then tuck it back inside the leaves. So they knew where it was, but the other ravens didn't. That was the funniest thing. So that is the backside of my garden. And Gary's got plans, lots and lots of plans. The reason he likes this part of the yard, and it is a wide property, is you can drive this, which makes life easier. You know, instead of having to haul everything down by carrying it, the driveway goes all the way through where you see that I gr I'm growing stuff and then it comes down here and then of course this is where they dropped wood chips before they actually could make it down there and then they've come through here and yes Gary did plant a lot of these pepper trees he's kind of sorry he did but he did he's taken some of them out because they have very invasive roots to his garden and they could they used to come down here and drop wood chips down here when Gary wanted wood chips because he was determined to grow only in the ground. I had a different way of growing. We both have different ways of growing, but he has changed it over the years and decided that he's gonna grow, as you can see, oh, look at the birds in his totes. See the birds in his totes? Let's take a peek real quick. So the birds are going in and out. Hopefully they're not eating any of the seedlings, but they will go in and out and eat, you know, something's coming up and then they'll look for insects. Look like those were toeys in there. But he originally was only going to plant in the ground. Over the years, things evolved because there was a root issue. So he's gonna tr change some of these trees to other different types of fruit trees. Then he had a rabbit issue, so he had to fence everything in. Then he had to cut the roots out by digging it down because the feeder roots that are getting into his plants are actually more surface-like. So he can cut it, you know, just by, when I say cut it, with a shovel. He can go through and with a shovel cut the roots. And what he's trying to do is bring in nature, but he just doesn't want rabbits and he doesn't want gophers. Planting in the ground, you don't want gophers because they will finish up your plants. And that's one thing you don't want. That's why I like totes. There are a lot of gophers here. I've had neighbors tell me they cannot grow anything because of the gophers. They can't grow anything because of the squirrels. They can't grow for various reasons. Well, let me tell you, there's ways of getting rid of gophers. That is one way to get rid of gophers. To get rid of squirrels, you can wrap it with tool. It works, and that includes rats and mice. It works. You can completely cover everything if you're doing greens and you don't need something to be pollinated. And keep in mind, a lot of your tomato and pepper plants, you can self-pollinate by a gentle shake. So it's whatever you're growing, that will be what you need to do. But it does work. He obviously is growing a lot, and so am I. We've worked it out. There are ways to grow. There's my garden. Now you can see up on top, that's the start of the bird garden. There is my beautiful pine trees. And there is the palm tree, which one day in the wind, there all the leaves were there and there. Gary thought, oh, I'm gonna have to have somebody come take all the leaves off. We had some bad wind, knocked it all off. And now it's self-grooming. It's been doing a wonderful job. And see, there's another avocado tree that's gone. You can see some of the avocado trees. Some of them are still hanging in there, but again, they're older. I mean, here's one right here. This is coming up from rootstock. Gary was gonna take it down. You can always graft, yes you can, but they're struggling trees. But actually this one is starting to make a comeback, so he's going to leave it. So going back to nature, because this is not a garden tour, he's trying to bring in birds too and grow different things here. Now here, I have no photographs. We were standing out here and we have seen twice a bobcat. So we know there, there are some bobcats, but what has happened is there's an over amount of coyotes now living in this area. And the coyotes don't have anything above them except for people. There's no bears or anything to take them out. So the coyotes have been wiping out a lot of animals that were here that we used to see not going to go through the whole list but there were a lot of them and we used to have a ton of road runners which were beautiful i'd come out and go onto the deck or go outside and see road runners they're all gone because they spend most of their time on the ground so anything that spends a lot of time on the ground have gotten wiped out we used to have raccoons here the raccoons now they're not dumb have moved into the city so have a lot of skunks 
I've had the school ask us where my kid, grandkids have gone. We've got skunks. What do we do? Well, they're not bothering anybody. I would leave them, but they did have some of them moved or do whatever they had to. But the skunks, if they can find enough shelter to hide from the coyotes, then you can have skunks around the property. So we've kind of built shelters, including the wood back there in different places for the skunks. Places where skunks can squeeze into and the coyotes cannot. We do have skunks here. You've probably seen the video when Gary got one in something and he had to take it out and he got sprayed. Uh, anyways, we do have skunks and I happen to like skunks. I actually, when I was a kid, years ago, I wasn't really, I guess I was older than a kid. I had a pet skunk for many, many years. And let me tell you, they love snails. So when they get into the garden, they're really not doing that much damage. They're eating the stuff you don't want. They'll eat snails and slugs. Yeah, skunks were a thing for a while as far as pets. There's a squirrel. And it definitely is a squirrel. Right in front of me. There it goes. Fortunately, it just came out of Gary's garden. But what are you going to do? We don't mind sharing. Let him go. And we have all kinds of stuff. Now, squirrels, as I was talking about coyotes, they can quickly and fast get up a tree. But a lot of your other things, like your skunks, your, your raccoons, your badgers, all that, they can't. So if they don't have a place to dart into and hide and get into a small little space where the coyotes can't go, well, that's what happens to them. So we have lost over the years a lot of those. Like I said, the raccoons have simply moved into the city where a lot of the animals that were here are gone. And he's taking off way down there. I don't know where he's going, but he came out of here. So we have, like I said, in my bird garden alone, and I'm going to set it up for more. I'd like to see more. We have now, I should redo, I did a video on the birds. Over, I'm going to say over 55 species of small birds. Small birds, that's not counting any of the bird of prey. And they come visit my garden all year long. They also go into Gary's garden too. Gary's had beautiful bluebirds in the morning. I've seen them, I'll be out on the deck and I'll see them uh, sitting up on top and they dive down. I think they're going to the water and they were taking a bath. Those are the bluebirds, not the scrub jays, bluebirds. So we have a lot of species of birds. When I first moved here back in the, let's say the mid eighties. In the eighties, we had some birds, but not a lot. And over the years, when we started our garden, which hasn't even been that long ago, it seems like it has brought in dozens of more species of birds because they found places to fly and look around. They can land in the trees. They can land and look around and see if it's safe enough for them to come down. If it's not safe, they go on their merry way. It's also brought in a lot of hummingbirds and hummingbirds nest everywhere. They nest in Gary's garden. They've been nesting, you saw, in the banana plants. They nest anywhere they can on Christmas lights, on cable wires. They try to find a place to build a nest out of the rain, out of the sun, and then they do their thing. And they can have one to four nests. So by just giving them that little something, you can bring in nature. And nature, keep in mind, does mean insects, does mean snakes. Now, a lot of places like in the city, you're not going to find a lot of snakes. I don't mind snakes. We don't have too many. We used to have king snakes. I haven't seen a king snake in, I'm going to say, close to 20 years. Racers, yes, I see them, and they're really fast, and they can shoot up a tree. They're amazing. I love them. And the gopher snakes, I've got one that lives in my front yard, and he comes out, and I've got to be careful because he sits and he crosses over, and I don't see him, and I'll step on him. But I haven't seen him for a while, so he may have already gotten ready to go into hibernation. I'm not sure. This will be fascinating when Gary gets this done, because I don't know what it will bring in and how the birds are going to really love this, and I think they're just going to go crazy with this. Because as this gets covered, this gives them a place and shelter away from hawks, the small birds, and they'll be able to come through here and forage for all kinds of insects. Your pollinators will just love this. We can walk into Gary's garden for a minute. So what else? So we have five species of hummingbirds here. And when I count birds, I don't count the species. I count the types. So when I say 50, that's 50. So in here, let's see. 
I can't even name all the birds. I've seen mockingbirds in here, kingbirds in here, different types of towhees in here. I have seen bluebirds in here. We have had tanagers now that came in. There has been the orioles. We have a couple different types of orioles that come in. And here's what the hummingbirds like, his canis. They love the, the red flowers. See that there's certain flowers that are designed by nature for certain birds and certain insects. Some insects won't be able to get in there, but a hummingbird with a long beak can get inside. So different flowers, that's why different flowers are important. Like these, this is a potato mint. This is perfect for bumblebees, honeybees, different types of bees. Hummingbirds may pick around, but they may not get as much. Remember, hummingbirds are picking either pollen or nectar. Not all flowers have both. So different flowers are designed by nature for different animals which drops the competition down for them. Same thing on birds when you're feeding, like we have white crown sparrows come in and they'll fight with the house finches. Why are they fighting with the house finches? When they come into the bowls and they try to push each other away because they're both feeding on the same food. When you've got other birds coming in there, like bush tits coming in and they're feeding all over and nobody's fighting because bush tits are coming in for insects, the white crown sparrows well, they're coming in strictly for the seed. So when animals are not eating the same food, then there's usually no problem as far as compatibility. They're fine with each other because there's no competition. Let's see, so what else can I say in here? So Gary's had hummingbirds nest in here. The Orioles have nested in his banana plants back there. We've had them. Mockingbirds in the front yard, they do a lot in bushes. Scrub jays will do wherever they can. They can go higher up. Hummingbirds, it's amazing, we can go eye level. You will be walking back and forth and not even notice that there's a hummingbird in front of you. And then, in, of course, here, the big thing with Gary and all his ponds are his dragonflies. He loves his dragonflies! He's had dragonflies all over the place in the summer. They've kind of died back now because the weather is so cool at night and we're going into winter soon. So the dragonflies are done until probably mid-spring. That's when you'll see a lot of birds coming around. The dragonflies will come out as soon as the weather warms up. So he has his dragonflies, which are really, really big. And this place will be just covered in dragonflies. They'll be zipping around, they'll be fighting with each other and creating their own territory because there's a pond over there and then there's another pond there and another pond there. And so what they do, thank goodness, is he's got enough ponds, is they decide which pond is theirs. And so you have multiple males trying to protect their pond. So it's not like he has one little fish pond. He's got multiple, so he can have multiple dragonflies living in the same area because they're protecting their territory. So he has that. And then finally this year, I don't know if he ended up with tadpoles or not, he had a lonely frog that was croaking in the middle of the night, which he has not had. So it finally this year he got it. And he would come down here and he would sit with his frog and look at his little frog and hope that a female came and that he ends up with frogs. We have found frogs in my garden, but I think they were just traveling and moving around. But with him, he did have one that staked a claim in one of his ponds and decided that this was his place. And he croaked his little heart out all night, very loud, it's amazing. But he did get his frog. So let's hope it has some tadpoles there. And let's hope he has more frogs because he loves his frogs. That's pretty much it. We have, like I said, all kinds of insects and all kinds of birds and reptiles that live here. And of course the furry animals. And that's okay. I mean, look at all the food he's growing. Look at all the greens that he's growing. I mean, for goodness sakes, there's no problem with us sharing because if they want to eat a little, they are not going to eat that much. And we have far more than what we need for us to survive, even sharing. And the point is we still have enough that whatever they've eaten, if they've eaten leaves that we don't want to use or the leaves start to go bad, this becomes our new soil. 
So that's important too. Don't worry about if you overgrow because by overgrowing, you're creating your own organic rich soil to grow in. You go buy a bag of soil, some of them is nothing more than broken down wood chips that have been composted down with maybe a few other things. But you pick your own leaves and just drop it either in a tote or let it sit on the ground and then dig it back up. You've got true matter like Mother Nature makes. The leaves fall, they rot, the microbes get in there, the earthworms get in there, and we have a ton of earthworms. Break everything down, and that is the richest, best soil you could possibly get. So don't worry about overgrowing something, even if it's something you're growing. Let's say you're growing some sort of color. These are tree colors. We've got a green one and a purple one. And let's say you don't like the green one. But the leaves off the green one are making your soil. So that's why it's important. I know some of you do comfrey. I do tree colors. Nothing's wrong with comfrey. You do it the way you want. But what you're doing is you're creating your very own soil. So that's my nature walk for today. It is beautiful here. There's nothing more peaceful this, than to sit here and just watch all the birds. Be it in my garden with all the birds feeding, that I absolutely love because I never know who's gonna come in. Like I said, I have photographed in my own garden on the property here, over 50 species of small birds, including in Gary's garden. And that is what fascinates me, that they have found this little paradise, and I'm hoping to build it up with more flowers, because flowers will bring in more birds. And there's nothing more beautiful than just sitting and listening and watching the birds. I enjoy that. It also lowers your blood pressure. I hear another bird. So with that, I hope I've given you a nice little tour, and I'll continue to do it. I haven't done a nature walk in a while. And if I forgot anything, well, it doesn't matter. You can ask a question or I'll remember for next time to add it in. So with that, have a wonderful, wonderful day. And don't forget to eat what you grow. Bye-bye.